much I could have failed to be failing in these way rapids too. Or forces, right? It's not failing there, it's failing okay. in retry. After that, some blocks. I don't rely on tons of the devils to put through the bake of the brewer for my dinner, but rather on the self interest. What we really meant is that the system markets rewards innovation and it works. But you know what? He never said, I won't get a benevolent butcher. But there are lots of fine public schools. Okay. And, and because you, but the problem is you rely on the benevolence of the butcher. Like those sell high, those sell public schools, great public school, but you know, the, the problem is the system as a whole obviously fails us because we're, we're losing generations of children in our urban centers. And I would argue that the private, if you allow the private sector Education. And the, and the yeah. failure of the financial system shows us what happens when when we rely exclusively on people's self-interest and people don't think about how, about their role in the system and behave responsibly. And how is this quote this quote about uh, Adam Smith is misquoted so many times because you don't rely on the benevolence of the merchants, that's true. But before Adam Smith wrote the wealth of nations, he also wrote the theory of moral sentences. Which basically makes an important point that the market has to function with a certain kind of morality, not, not corporate greed run and walk. And so basically, I go back to my three points I made. You want to make the market function better, but as John is saying, if you leave the market completely alone, you know, it goes into many different kinds of spasms in terms of speculation and lot of risk taking. How do you explain the fact that how do you explain the fact that in the in the cities in the inner cities where you have Catholic, Catholic school students are outperforming the public school students? They're not having the same amount of trouble, and they're and by constitution they cannot be subsidized by the government. I mean, I went through I went through my entire education to the Catholic system. There was no government aid at all. And uh, they consistently have all performed, and Lutheran schools have all performed. It's what you're saying. saying. It's about the inputs. Uh, this, is, this has been uh, <laughs> 10 minutes on one question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're going to be doing two minutes a question. One minute and one minute. All right? Um, and the next question is just as big. How does the new global economy impact what is currently happening in our economy, and, what are, uh, and how does that affect this type of stimulus or non-stimulus, as the case may be? Well, I think if you take a look at the global fund, all the financial markets are calling for currency stability. I mean, the G21 currency stability. Uh, Russia and China have come up with, they, they've actually said the word gold standard, which almost fell over. I mean, but both countries are saying, we don't want this instability of the dollar. And I think, I think one of the things that, as the, the stimulus package, as the Fed steps in to buy those bonds and creates more money, that's going to create instability in the international markets. It's going to create instability in the dollar, and I think that's a ma major mistake. Well, my, I, I think if you read the G20 communique, they don't talk about the stability of exchange rates. They talk about rebalancing. They talk about cases where countries are running persistent deficits and persistent surpluses. We in the U.S. have to get our house in order. We have to, as a country, private sector and public, uh, start living more within our means. You know, one, of the, one of the untold stories about this whole downturn in, in global terms is that the, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, China, and India, are slowly getting more power. You know, and, uh, and in fact, one of the, there was a new site in NPR yesterday saying that the central banks all across the world are actually stocking up more on euros rather than the American dollar, which is not a good sign. No, I agree. That's, what, that's my point. All right. We have agreement. There's a good one. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So this one was addressed to uh, Gary, Larry, and Harry. Um, it seems that you have a, that you assume if prices go down, people will spend. Why? I'm not sure I saw that. Well, uh, what happens is over a long period of time, when, we, when prices go down, all of a sudden people have more options. And uh, for example, let's say given gas is 4.50 a gallon. Now, I don't have a statistic with me, but when it dropped to around two dollars a gallon, that that provided more stimulus than, than the Bush package. Is all of a sudden people have more money in their pockets and their options open up. And what are the options? Well, suddenly they could pay off debt, which I think is a good thing, and frankly, um, I'm surprised that you're in Grand Rapids, but that's really what I don't want But in any event, uh, they would pay off debt, they would uh, begin to have more money in their pockets. So I think falling prices are a good thing. I mean, Henry 
did that. Why? Because he lowered the cost of the plant. He lowered the cost of the plant. I asked the bottom. I think that's the best economic you can get. Okay, let's think about that a little bit. I think everybody would agree that if prices go down, consumers buy more. But at a time like the Great Depression, or like in 2008, when there's paralyzing fear, you know, even if prices go down, people don't buy that much because they're confident to slow down. That's why, that's why the government sector is the only sector that can step in to restore confidence. The private sector investment is down. Consumer expenditure is down. Exports are down. There's nothing that's propping up the economy. Well, you certainly need additional falling prices. You need a climate of certainty and you need an absence of fear. But this idea that somehow uh, the fear and the uncertainty was all generated in the private sector and the government had to rescue us is absurd. At the same time, you had falling prices. Throughout the 30s, you had Roosevelt jacking up taxes in the stratosphere. You had uh, erratic monetary policy in the Federal Reserve. You had uh, the NIRA and the AAA uh, destroying crops and cattle and paying uh, to, to have that destruction. You had all this craziness. Uh, that, that created the climate in which anybody who had any money to invest would not have invested in here if they had their money in the right place. And for those of you interested in that, Bob Hicks has a really good book called uh, Depression and War, and uh, he has a whole chapter on the regime uncertainty that the Roosevelt administration created. Sir, so, I think this idea of uh, regime uncertainty is an important idea. That basically. You have to be more consistent in terms of your policy so that there's less uncertainty. That's, that's a really good idea. But the problem is that at that time, no one really knew. We are analyzing all this stuff with historical hindsight. But at that time, no one really knew what's actually going to work. So FDR tried this idea of bold experimentation. And a lot of his, all of his ideas were very good, and they stand to this day. Some of his ideas were obviously bad. You know, so, so I'm not saying that the private sector created all the uncertainty. Uh, I think the fundamental point of difference between our two sides is you guys look at every crisis, whether it be the 30s or the more recent one, as you know, we just sort of start out with the crisis and, and government as the innocent bystander, and it now has to rescue us. And I'm suggesting, and I think you can call it as well, that you guys need to do a little bit more work on the role that the government played in creating these crises. You can't just say, oh, crisis, government must have been an innocent bystander and now has to rescue us. That is uh, so fundamentally flawed as to be uh, off, really off base. Quick one for Brian. All right. Are we in danger of losing our collective memory of the 1939 recession? They said 39 or 20 months. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we certainly have lost the, uh, the collective memory of the 1929 uh, recession. The, the, the conditions uh, were exactly the same as 10 years later. So the question we should be asking historically is why was there not a great depression in the 1920s? And there wasn't because there was a recommitment to price stability and there were significant tax cuts. There was also internationalism, too. There was a sense of it. The only correction that wasn't made was that this, 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 this very suggested this remarks was to was to anchor the uh, targeting of the consumer price index by ensuring a stable price of gold. If that had been done, and that was done in Bretton Woods in 1944, then you would have had a permanent boom. The Great Depression would have never occurred. Um, I, I think it's time to understand that the Great Depression occurred because of the policy mistakes. I think Brian's uh, approach to the Great Depression is quite anachronistic. The idea that the Federal Reserve in the 1920s was targeting the price levels, I think if you look back at monetary doctrine in those days and Fed operating procedures, you'll see that they, they had, well, they had very little idea what the price level was because we didn't measure it in those days the way we do now. There was no consumer price index in 1925. But the, the, what, what they were trying to target was, was what they called free reserves. And, and that's a quantitative measure of the money supply. So Brian's, Brian's explanation, I think, reads back into history uh, a bunch of economic theories that have been concocted in the last 20 years, but that you know economists have 